Jesus' name, amen. Great, great morning, church family. Listen, we are excited to worship this morning. I got Katie here this morning, Dale here this morning. Listen, y'all excited to worship God this morning? Y'all excited? Yeah. <laughs> Listen, right where you are, you can get up, you can dance with us, have a good time. Let's worship the King of Kings right there at home. Praise the Lord. Dale, give me some more of that guitar. Come on.
Though the night may get darker, though the waiting seems long, you have always been faithful to remind me of your love. I'm really happy you're joining us today for a start of a brand new series that we're calling Jesus on Every Page. In particular, we're going to be looking a lot at the Old Testament leading up to Easter to see how Jesus was shown to us many, many, many years before he ever arrived on this planet, died on the cross, rose from the dead. We have this message on repeat throughout the entire Old Testament. So in these days leading up to Easter, in a sense, we're going to back into the Easter message, but I think you're going to really get a lot of good stuff out of this series, a lot of things that'll strengthen your faith, a lot of things I think will encourage you in your walk with the Lord. But as we get started today, would you just bow your heads for a moment with me while we pray? Lord, we are grateful. You are so good. And we're going to see your goodness on display today like we seldom have before. And I just pray that this truth, more than anything, 
will so permeate our heart, will so saturate our minds, will, will so revolutionize the way we approach the spiritual life that, God, we will know by the end of this message that you've given us something of substance that really has the power to transform our daily experience with you. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, someone asked the great theologian R.C. Sproul the question, what's the greatest spiritual need in the world today? Sproul's answer without hesitation was this, the greatest need in people's lives is to understand the true identity of God. You know, there's a lot of people who claim to reject faith when their real problem is that they don't understand the nature of the God that they're rejecting. They don't see God as he is. Instead, they've been wounded by their upbringing or toxic churches or even hypocritical Christians, and that has done significant damage to their God image. So the greatest spiritual need that exists in the world is for people to understand who God really is. But then Sproul was asked a follow-up question. What's the greatest spiritual need in the lives of church people, of believers? You know what he said? Same answer, to understand the true identity of God. I'll tell you this, after 36 and a half years of full-time pastoral ministry, I'd say exactly the same thing. If believers really understood who God is, what's in his heart, how compassionate he truly is, how quick he is to offer a remedy for sin, it would change their lives forever. More than anything, that's what I hope to do in this series. We're going to look at how God revealed himself to human beings, in particular in the Old Testament, because there's a pattern I've observed that I think a lot of people pass over or sometimes miss altogether. And that pattern is whenever human beings make a mess of things, Every time and in every circumstance, God does something redemptive. That's the pattern. Foul up, then redemption. Foul up, then redemption. And what this really is, is a promise that God would ultimately bring about a remedy for all of our sins. And these redemptive moments are done in anticipation of what God was yet to do to set things right in the world through the cross and on Easter Sunday morning. So in these weeks leading up to Easter, we're going to back into Easter. We're going to look at Jesus through the lens of the Old Testament. The Old Testament tells us many things about Christ through symbols and images and even promises. So the first message that we're going to look at, the one we're going to look at today, is a promise. And I'll explain more about what that means in a minute. Then we're going to look at a dreamer. In that message, which is next week, I'm going to show you how the life of Joseph is a type or pattern of Christ. And then finally, on Easter Sunday, I want to explore a thread that runs through the entire Old Testament, a concept called a third-day God. And in that message, I'll show you how God trained his people to expect, to anticipate deliverance on the third day. So think of these messages as Easter in the Old Testament. They're a powerful example of how, if you read carefully and with discernment, you literally find Jesus on every page. Today, I want to begin with a question. What is Satan's preferred method of attack? So we're going to camp out in the book of Genesis. This is the story I want to focus on. It's this. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the other wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat free from the tree that's in, from the tree that's in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. So get this, Adam and Eve lived in paradise, a perfect environment, unscarred by hatred, conflict, or sin. Then Satan shows up in the form of a serpent. When you look at what I just read to you, you see the serpent painting a picture of God as somehow denying Adam and Eve something they needed to be happy. This is Satan's preferred method of attack. He attacks and distorts the character of God. This is why it's important to understand the first temptation is not really the forbidden fruit. The first temptation is to doubt the nature of God. It's to question God's goodness. In fact, truthfully, that's the beginning of all sin, a judgment we make about God. That's why you sin. That's why I sin. I don't trust God. 
I don't trust when he tells me, this is not good for you. I start believing that God is withholding something that I need to be happy. So I sin. Sin always begins with a false picture of God. Satan suggested to Eve, how unreasonable for God to restrict you in this way. You need this. It'll be good for you. By the way, this is a standard technique in debate to force your opponent to debate you on your terms and place their position in the worst possible light. In addition, when the serpent talks to Eve about God, he doesn't use the personal name of God, which is Yahweh. Instead, he uses the title Elohim, the more generic term for God. In other words, he calls God by his title, not by his name. In this way, what Satan is doing is subtly depersonalizing Adam and Eve's relationship with God. He's trying to create some relational distance there. He's beginning to drive a wedge between our first parents and God. Now think about this. If Satan had begun with a whole-scale attack on the character of God, Eve would have immediately gotten her defenses up and not listened to another word the serpent had to say. Instead of swaggering up to Adam and Eve and telling them to defy God, he simply sowed the seeds of doubt in their mind. So get this, Adam and Eve have paradise, anything and everything they could ever want. Blessings untold, amazing fellowship with God, and pure, unhindered relationships with one another. There was only one thing they were denied, and what they were denied, they decided they simply had to have. Had to have because it was something they believed was good and was being denied to them. Therefore, God was not good for not allowing them to have it in the first place. Isn't that exactly what we do? We think we know what's best. I know what I need and I know what I have to have to be happy. In fact, I know better than God. So the first temptation is always to doubt the goodness of God. You know, one of the very first things you and I ever learn about God is that he's good. In many homes, we prayed a simple prayer before meals. God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for our food. Amen. In that prayer, we declared it. God is good. From cover to cover in the Bible, the one characteristic of God the authors keep coming back to is the goodness of God. They tell us, despite all the bad in the world, God, you are good, and what you do is good. Author and theologian Richard Niebuhr once said it like this, Most of our problems in life come because we refuse to believe that God is as good as he says he is. What he's saying is our whole outlook on life would change radically if we really believe that God is good. One of the most important things I'm going to say to you today is a simple fact that the goodness of God is not some minor league truth about God. It's this truth, practically more than any other truth, that has profound implications for how we relate to God. It's the lens through which we see all of God's other attributes. That's because when we say God is good, we mean that his love is good, his power is good, his mercy is good, and his holiness is good. That everything that defines God is good. If God had power but didn't have love, he would not be good. If God had patience but didn't have wisdom, he would not be good. So the goodness of God is more than just another characteristic of God. It's a lens. It's a way of seeing God. Believe it or not, whether you believe God is good impacts every choice you make. In the fall of Adam and Eve, Satan undermined their confidence in God's goodness and once they doubted that, the fall, it took care of itself. Listen to Larry Crabb explain. I love this quote. He said, Our failure to follow God's leading reflects a lack of deep confidence in His goodness. The problem of unsteady commitment is not centrally a problem of the will. It is rather deficient belief. If we knew He was good, we would sense a deep desire to follow Him. Crab is making an incredibly important point that a lot of pastors need to hear. When people in the church seem to be unsteady in their commitment, a lot of pastors double down on this idea that people just aren't trying hard enough. In other words, they blame the problem on the will, that people just don't want to do it. But what's actually flawed is their belief system. They don't really trust in the goodness of God. The problem is not a failure to try, it's a failure to trust. It's deficiency of belief. Larry Crabb says our problem is a failure to believe in the goodness of God. That's why we sin. That's why we fail at obedience. I sin when I come to believe that God does not have my best interests at heart, that his way is not best, that he is not good. And once I believe that somehow God has failed me, then I decide it's my right to get what I want for myself. 
So before I'm ever tempted to take a drink or lust after a man or woman or cheat on a business deal or lie in order to get my way, the first temptation, the temptation before all other temptations, is to doubt the goodness of God. That was true with Adam and Eve, and it's still true of us today. Now let me tell you something from personal experience. I was schooled in unhealthy fundamentalism. I was trained to be a legalist. I rededicated my life every week because of my constant failures and shortcomings. I was a miserable Christian, trying to live the Christian life in my own power, and it all utterly failed. The kind of Christianity I'd put my faith in taught me that I was in charge of changing my life, and when I failed, it was because I just wasn't trying hard enough. But friends, I couldn't change my life on my own. I needed the power of grace, the power of love. I needed to discover what Jesus really taught about the key to obedience. There are two things that had to change and did change in my belief system. The first one is simply this. Number one, I dared to believe that God was as good as Jesus made him out to be. Jesus once said, to see him is to see the Father. So if you can imagine Jesus approaching you just as he did every other broken person he met in the New Testament, if you can see Jesus the friend of sinners, if you can see him in his gentleness, in his grace, in his infinite patience, and know that that's how he relates to you, then you'll finally have a really clear image of the Father, and you'll know that he's a good, good God. But that's not all. The second thing that changed my belief system is this. I decided I was going to start living like that was true, because it is true. I would live like the truth is true. I know, revolutionary concept, right? But the truth is, many of us don't live the truth. Instead, we live the lies that we tell ourselves. So I decided I would accept at face value that God loves me, accepts me, sees me, and treats me in the same way Jesus does. That's the key to obedience, to see him and love him as he is, not trying harder. My willpower is too broken to do anything other than increase my own frustration. I learned that the hard way. But God's love is limitless. He's able to do in, through, and for me what I can't do for myself. Everything changes when your God image changes. It's like what A.W. Tozer once said, the most important thing about you is what comes to mind when you think of God. So back to our story. We call this story the fall of humankind. The worst thing imaginable has happened. God's creatures, the very first humans, have rebelled against him and did the very thing he told him not to do. So now the big question is, what will God do? Before we move on with this story, let me tell you a very important principle in Bible study. It's called the law of first mention. Basically what the law of first mention says is this, the first occurrence of anything in scripture is something we should pay careful attention to because it tends to set precedents for what comes after. It helps us to know what to expect from here on out. It gives us great clarity about how things work and what things mean. So when Adam and Eve sin, this marks the first mention of sin in the Bible, which means what God does here in response to sin is what we can expect from him in the future. Does that make sense? Why? Because this is what God is really like. This is who he really is, which leads to this question, what do we learn about God in his response to the first sin? Now, let me explain. The Bible tells us that Adam and Eve are not merely an illustration for us. They're a representation of us, which means this is not merely an interesting story about the first couple who happen to be like us in certain ways. They are us. This story is about you and it's about me. My heart is just like theirs. And every time we sin, we repeat what they did. But also how God responds to Adam and Eve's failure is the same way he responds to our failures. God is unchanging. The theological term for that is the immutability of God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So once this betrayal happens, what do you expect God to do? Do you think he'll be angry? Do you expect his wrath? Do you think the hammer's about to fall? What will be the very first thing God does? You know, you can tell a lot about a person from their initial reaction to anything. It may surprise you to learn that what we find first is not punishment, but pursuit. So let's take a look at God's pursuit. Here's what the scripture says happened. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Now get this, after Adam and Eve sin, they run away. They put as much distance between themselves and God as they possibly could. 
the human response to sin was flight, but that was not God's response. The first thing God does is come looking for them. You know, there's a lot of people who think that judgment always comes first with God, but when you pay attention to what the Bible actually says, what comes first is pursued. God seeks out the man and the woman. There's no fire raining down from heaven, no lightning bolts of wrath, no thunderous voice from the sky speaking words of condemnation. No. The very first thing Adam and Eve heard was the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Isn't that amazing? I mean, you can hardly imagine a more peaceful and serene scene than that. This is how God responds on that terrible day of the fall. In other words, he comes to them in the same way he's come a hundred times before. He comes to visit his children. Does God know what has happened? Well, of course he does. God is omniscient. He knows everything. But God is still acting as if nothing has changed. Do you know why? Because on God's side, nothing had changed. God is still who he's always been. It's why the Bible says when we're faithless, he remains faithful. You can bet the farm that God will do what God has always done. You can count on God to keep showing up. The break, the fracture in the relationship, that occurs on our side of the relationship, not God's. Friends, God is not unpredictable. He doesn't fly off the handle. He never arbitrarily devastates innocent people. Instead, just like everything else we've seen in the Bible before God judges, He investigates. He doesn't begin with accusation, but conversation. Even when his people are less than honest in their response, everything God says, everything God does is done in grace. And our first glimpse of this is not Jesus on the cross, but in the garden with our very first parents. What I'm telling you is that it's not just the New Testament that teaches grace. It's taught in the Old Testament too. So God pursues. He shows up just like he had always done before. That's followed by God's prompting. The first words God speaks are actually a question. Adam, where are you? Now, personally, I've always found it fascinating when God asks a question. One of these days, I really want to do a series just on the questions that God asks in the Bible. The reason God's questions fascinate me is because an omniscient being, that is a God who knows everything, never needs to ask a question for information. I mean, it's not like God doesn't know where Adam is, right? When God asks a question, he's doing it for other reasons than for information. So why is God asking this? Well, it's because he wants Adam to think about where he is. Adam, where are you? What are you doing there? Why do you feel a need to hide? Do you like your newfound freedom? Did things turn out the way you expected? Is this everything you were hoping for? Is this the happiness you were seeking? You see, God is opening up a dialogue with Adam to give him the opportunity to come clean and come back into the relationship. Here's what Adam says in response. I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I knew I was naked. I was filled with shame and I hid. This is the first mention of fear in the Bible. Fear is innately tied to sin. Sin causes us to fear rejection in relationship. Then God asks another question. Why have you eaten from the tree? Again, God knows the answer to this question, right? He just wants to know if Adam is going to be honest. So summoning up all the courage he has, Adam says, it was the woman. But not just the woman, he says, it was the woman you gave me. So now blame has entered into human history. No one wants to face the truth about themselves. We always want to find a scapegoat. We always want to make someone else responsible for our poor choices. So let me ask you something. Was this a good response on the part of Adam? Do you think this is what God most longed to hear out of him? Adam blaming his wife and by extension blaming God for what happened? No, obviously not. But here's the deal. Even in light of the fact that Adam is not being completely honest and is skirting responsibility for his own choices by blaming others, God still makes an incredible promise. So let's look at God's promise. Genesis 3.15 has been called the first gospel because everything else in the Bible flows out of this one verse. This is the first promise found in relation to the first sin. And it tells us three important things. Like number one, there will be continual conflict. What God says is, I will put enmity between you and the woman. He's speaking to the servant here. And he says to the servant, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. Now that word enmity means hostility or animosity. One translation says, there will be war. 
And this war will not just be between Eve and the devil, but also between her seed and the devil's seed. This phrase really stands out because in the Jewish world, the male is considered to be the one who has the seed. Children are normally referred to as the seed of their father, not the seed of their mother. So why does this verse talk about her seed? Because ultimately what this is referring to is the one who would arise from the seed of the woman without the seed of man. It's talking about the virgin birth of Christ. When the Messiah was born, he was born of the seed of the woman that was made fertile by the Holy Spirit. There was no male seed involved. So in the very first promise, made in regard to the very first sin, God ultimately and already knows what it's going to take to set things right in the world. He will send his own son into the world, born of the seed of woman, to bring about redemption for all humankind. The next thing this verse says is that the seed of the woman will suffer. And it says the seed of the woman will suffer temporary defeat. So again, God says to the serpent, you will strike his heel. The Bible tells us that the seed of the serpent would rise up and strike the heel of the woman's seed. Now let me ask you something. Where does a snake usually strike? Lower leg, heel, or foot? They're moving along the ground, so that's the natural strike zone on the body that they're closest to. When the Bible says he will strike his heel, it means two things. First, it's telling us that in this life, sometimes Satan wins a battle or two. This verse reminds us that life is not a bed of roses. It's a war where the bad guys win from time to time. Satan will attack and wound the seed of the woman. But there's something else. When Christ died on the cross, Satan struck his heel. I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but this part of the promise was fulfilled quite literally. When Jesus was nailed to the cross, we know what were the parts of the body that the nails were driven through. The Bible says his hands and his feet. Now, typically, we know from history that the feet were often laid on top of one another and the spike driven through at the heel, which means Satan literally bruised the heels of Jesus Christ. But there's a third truth in this verse, and it's this. The seed of the woman will be victorious, and the serpent will be dealt a fatal blow. Once again, God says to the serpent, he will crush your head. Now, if you know anything about snakes, you know that stomping on a snake's midsection won't do anything but make it mad. In fact, some snakes, you can literally chop them in half and they'll survive. And I mean, that's just not right. If you want to kill a snake, you've got to deal with its business end. The only way to kill a snake is to crush his head. And what this verse says is even though the serpent will bruise the heel, will strike the heel of the seed of the woman, the seed of the woman would rise up and crush the serpent's head. This is what Christ would do on the cross, deal a fatal blow to his enemy. He would crush his head. So God is making a promise, the first promise in response to the first sin, that the day would come when there would be an offspring or seed of the woman. There would be a child, a son of our mother Eve, who would set everything right. One day, guilt and shame and death will meet their match. Bad things won't get the final word. God gets the last word, and it's going to be good. So this is God. And this is what he's really like. This is his response to the very first sin. He moves immediately to set things right. God is a God of grace. God is always working to redeem. But when Adam and Eve sinned, they unleashed a contagion that has spread throughout the entire world, including me and everybody listening to me today. We've been corrupted. Humanity is valuable, for sure, but it's also broken. And that leads to this fourth thing, and that's God's provision. The scripture goes on to say, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. When Adam and Eve covered their nakedness with fig leaves, you just got to know that was never going to be a long-term solution. They were only temporary at best. So first, there's sin, then they experience shame, and whenever you experience shame, you feel a desperate need to cover it up to hide. So this is where God steps in. Without waiting to be asked, God provides for them coverings made from animal skins. Now, if you think about it, in order to make clothes out of animal skins, the animals would first have to die. The death of those animals, implied in the text, not directly stated, involves sacrifice and the shedding of blood. This is the first picture in the Bible of what it would take to make a covering for sin, the shed blood of a sacrifice. Let me remind you again of the law of first mention. What we see God doing here in response to human sinfulness is vitally important. It tells us what needs to be done. It's setting a precedence. It makes us expect this in the future, which of course it does. In the Old Testament sacrificial system that led to Jesus, the Lamb of God, who suffered, bled, and died to cover our sins. So before God discusses consequences, 
He supplies remedy. He pursues, he promises, he provides. This is the God we know and love. This is how God actually is. This is the first picture we have of God responding to sin. And let me tell you something, my friends, God is unchanged. He's still in the pursuing business, still in making promises, still providing a remedy for our greatest failures. There's nothing you have done that's too great for God to forgive. Your deepest regrets and your greatest shame are no match for the unconditional love of God. So the final question I want to ask is simply this, what does the future hold for these two sinners? First, let's talk about God's measured judgment. You know, God has been betrayed by his creatures, but he didn't respond in kind. He didn't respond unpredictably like the gods of the pagans were known to do. He gave them hope. He dealt kindly with their immediate need. The first negative words spoken were directed at the serpent, not Adam and Eve. The serpent, God's enemy and ours, will have a human adversary who will defeat him. He will rise up and crush the serpent's head. Satan may have had a great victory in the Garden of Eden, but one day he'll suffer an even greater defeat. He might win a battle or two along the way, but he has no hope of ever winning this war. So at issue is this next question, what is cursed and what is consequence? So there's two verses I want to call your attention to, Genesis 3.14 and Genesis 3.17. First, we're told that the serpent is cursed. It says, because you've done this, cursed are you. Then also in verse 17, that the ground is cursed. He says, cursed is the ground because of you. Now, everyone agrees that the serpent and the ground are cursed. What they don't agree on is whether or not the man and woman are cursed. Based on my understanding, my study of this passage, I see no place where the Bible describes Adam and Eve as being cursed. Think of it like this. Consequence and curse are two entirely different things. A curse is a pain or a loss which is directly inflicted by the lawgiver. It's a vindication of his justice for the violation of the law. A consequence is the natural outcome of a poor choice. So these verses explicitly say only the serpent and the ground were cursed. In regards to the ground, humankind's dominion over the earth has now been severely compromised. The earth will now produce thorns, thistles, weeds, and even brussel sprouts. Yes, brussel sprouts are a part of the curse. Just taste them if you don't believe me. But I believe if we were being careful students of God's word, God does not curse the man or, or the woman. What we have in Genesis 3, 16 to 17 is a description of the life they would now have, the consequence that would flow out of their fateful decisions. So one of the things God says is that the woman's desires will be for her husband. In other words, she's going to desire to have her way. She seeks to control. But try as she might, for any number of reasons, she will fail to gain that control, and so as a result will live in frustration. The relationship between husband and wife has become a competition for control because the man also has this same distortion caused by sin. As a result of sin, the Bible says he would seek to rule over his wife. In other words, he wants to control her too. Because of the fall, because human beings are sinful, men want to dominate women, to be in charge, to be in control. This is not the way God ordained for us to live. This is what humans do in their brokenness. We want our way more than we want God's way or anyone else's way. The selfishness of sin makes us try to control one another. Let me just point this out. This idea that men are supposed to rule over women is what the Bible describes as the result of sin, not the divinely ordained way to live. In light of that, I think it's absolutely flabbergasting that there are churches and pastors today who lift up the consequences of the fall of humankind as the pattern for the home instead of what existed before the fall. This is not what God intended. God did not mean for men and women to wage war for control. What began as good and perfect has now soured. That's what sin does. This is the consequence of sin. The desire to have our own way is a result of sin. That's what control is. It's the desire to have my way, and you will see that sin most clearly manifested in relationship. So Adam and Eve were not cursed by God, but they do face consequences for their sin. So as we wrap up, I want to remind you that there's another Eden story in the Bible. It's really an anti-Eden story. It's a repetition of this story that happened in the garden, but this story I'm talking about is no ordinary gar garden, which is why I call my last point, Jesus enters anti-Eden. At the beginning of his ministry, we're told that Jesus was taken by God into the wilderness where he'd be tempted by the devil. 
The Gospel of Mark adds a small detail that the others don't. He tells us that Jesus goes off into the wilderness among the wild beasts. Now think about this. Adam was tempted in a garden, in paradise, in a place where all the animals were under his dominion and stewardship. No predatory relationships among the animals and no fear of humans. But Jesus, when he comes to this earth, does he enter paradise? No. He goes into the wilderness. Some translations say the desert. And what's a desert? A desert is a cursed garden. It's a place where there's no food to eat. It's barren, no water, not a place that's been subdued by humans. It's a wasteland, a place where the wild beasts are. So Jesus, in entering our world, enters into this cursed Eden, this world of brokenness and sin. Planet Earth is now the opposite of Eden. It's the anti-Eden. Then the enemy comes to Jesus. The tempter wants him to doubt God's plan, to doubt God's goodness, to covet what God has chosen not to give. He wants Jesus to covet a plan that was different, not as difficult, and certainly not one whereby Jesus would have to endure humiliation, abandonment, rejection, and loss of his life and blood on the cross. This was Satan's attempt to get Jesus to grab for the things God had chosen not to give, just like he'd done to Adam and Eve. Satan says, you don't have to do it this way. Do it my way. Everything about Jesus coming into the world is a repetition of this story in the Garden of Eden, except now everything is opposite. Adam lost everything in a perfect environment. Jesus enters a totally imperfect environment to win everything back. Jesus was victorious where Adam failed. Jesus wanted only the Father's plan. Jesus embraced God's plan fully. He faced the lies of the enemy without sin. He died on the cross to redeem us from our sin. Paul writes this, For just as through the disobedience of one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. In other words, we don't just find ourselves in Genesis 3. We don't just find ourselves in the story of Adam and Eve. We also find ourselves in the story of Christ. Jesus Christ opened the way to God, anyone, anywhere, anytime. Here's another verse that Paul wrote. He said, For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. I mean, that's the choice. And that's ultimately where our story leads us. It leads us from Genesis 3 all the way to the Gospels, all the way to the cross, all the way to the resurrection. That God is doing something redemptive for all humankind. He's fulfilling the promise he made to our first parents years ago that he would bring about and raise up the seed of the woman in order to crush our enemy's head and to set us free once and for all. You know, for some who maybe are hearing this message for the first time, I hope more than anything, maybe maybe you've had kind of planted in your head, planted in your soul this idea that God is not good, that God is this God of wrath, that even in the Old Testament, he's always devastating and decimating whole people groups. And, and I just got to tell you, that's a distortion. That, that, that's human beings who are broken, reading their brokenness onto the Bible. What we see in the Bible from the very first sin is a God who in compassion comes to meet us in our brokenness, who provides remedy. I mean, it's such a wonderful image of grace. Some of you need to trust God as he is. That's the most important question today. Who is God? What is he really like? And if you don't know him, you can know him. Come to know the God of the Bible. The other group I want to speak to are believers, because in the same way that Sproul was asked, what's the most important question that people need answered in the world is, who is God? He said, that's also the most important question that believers need answered. Who is God and what's he really like? Because, you know, for some of us, even though maybe we're Christians and we claim to be Christ's followers, there is a very real sense in which the distortions around our God image have caused so much defeat, dissatisfaction, frustration in our life. You think it's all about you. You think that every time you fall on your face, it's because you're just not good enough and, and your will failed and you're not trying hard enough. And I'm here to tell you, it's, it's not a problem of your willpower. The problem is you got some wrong beliefs in your head, especially about who God is, especially about the goodness of God. Because when you begin to see God as he really is and you understand how good he is, You will begin to live and love that God like you never have before. Sin is always a result of having doubted the goodness of God. So I want you to do two things. The same thing I learned to do. One, 
to believe that God really is as good as Jesus made him out to be. That you just, you write that down. You, you put it on your refrigerator. You put it on your mirror. You put it on your dashboard in your car. God is as good as Jesus made him out to be. And number two, you're going to start living like that is true because the truth is true. And if you start living like the truth is true, Jesus said, you will know the truth and that truth will set you free. This is the kind of truth that can liberate you, can liberate you from the bondage to a broken image of God, can set you free to become the people you were meant to be. Would you pray with me now? Father, I just am so grateful that from cover to cover in this book, the more I study and learn about you, the more I fall in love with you. The more I am acutely aware that who you were, who you are, is who you will always be. That, Lord, we see you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. That, God, you are a God of grace. That you responded to the very first sin the same way you respond to our sin. You, 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 you show up. You pursue us. You, you, you speak passionately to our soul. You, you, you make promises, God. You offer provision for covering for our sin. You do that in compassion. And I just pray, God, if someone doesn't know you in a personal relationship, it may be because that the God image they have in their soul is one that absolutely is incongruent with everything about who you are. Help them, God, to have the faith today to say, God, I'm going to trust that you really are a good, good father. That, Lord, what has been layered up in my life, what has been deposited in my soul, has largely been a distortion of who you are. And I just want to know you as you really are. I want to follow you. I want to live for you. I want to love you. I believe Jesus died for me. I believe he is the remedy, the promise that was spoken about in the book of Genesis that's fulfilled in the gospel, that Jesus came, gave his life on the cross, shed his blood, rose on the third day. And because of that, I am fully forgiven and I can be fully free. And so, Lord, as best I know how, I just give you my life. I ask you to come in, change me from the inside out. And God, for believers that are here right now, believers who live such defeated lives, believers who live with such frustration, believers who feel like they carry the weight of responsibility on their own shoulders to somehow change or transform their own life, that, God, they would come to understand that, God, you really are as good as Jesus made you out to be. And that, Lord, they're going to start living the truth instead of living the lies. They're going to start living like the truth is true. They're going to just accept at face value that you accept them, that you love them, that you're for them, that you're providing for their every need. That, God, we're going to live like the truth is true because, Lord, we want to be set free. We want to know the freedom that comes from having a healed God image so that we really live and respond to you as you actually are. I thank you, God, for what you're going to be doing this weekend in so many lives and hearts and in the coming days that, God, you are going to be drawing people back to yourself. All of us who are, are observing Lent and taking this time to fast and to pray have been anticipating, God, that you're going to do something powerful and marvelous. And we're not waiting for Easter for that to happen. We believe that miracle is beginning to be unleashed right now. And so, Lord, do that miracle in somebody's life today. In Christ's name I pray, amen. We are always just so glad that you would join us wherever it is and whatever day it is that you happen to be joining us. We're grateful that you made Spring Creek in this service a part of your special day. Please, if, if this uh, message has in any way spoken to your life, if maybe you have friends who really need to know who God is. It is the most important question in life. Take a moment. Don't just like this message, but, but share it. Share it on your timeline. Share it through social media. Let us know about how this is impacting your life. Tell us about what God is speaking to you about, how he's setting you free, what you're learning about him. Those things get us so excited as pastors, and we would love to hear from you. So let us know in the comments. You can always uh, send us an email at info at springcreekchurch.org. We'd love to hear from each and every one of you. Thank you for being with us. I hope to see you again next week.